Welcome to a night. Welcome to Reaper's Digest. Hello. Uh, my name is Duke Ralston. I am the co-host of Tennessee Macabre. And I am Blake Ray, lead singer of the band Blood Oaks and uh, the co-founder of Pulp Factory e -Zine. And today we're talking about Cask of Amontillado. Yes, we are. By Edgar Allan Poe. What are you drinking today, Duke? Well, you know, I had a busy day, and I had a six-pack of Big River IPA, and um, I didn't go get anything else because I love this beer. So Fair I'm enough. having Big River IPA. There you go. I've got – let's see if you can see this. I bought this because of the label. Oh, wow. Third Wind. I love the label. Third Wind. Yeah, Third Wind by uh, – New Realm Brewing uh -huh. out of Georgia. Uh huh. We're going to try it right now. Okay. okay. So, uh, is, it, my is it like a lager or an IPA? Or? It is a dry hop Belgian style triple. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it is high gravity, so I'm only, mm -hmm. you know, I've only got the pint. Yeah, those, those Belgians don't fool around. Oh, no. This is not a for-play beer. I I had something one time at Loopy's. It was called Kirsten Donk. Yeah. And the guy come out and he said, man, this is the strongest beer I've ever had in my life. It's, it's brewed by Trappist monks in Belgium, and they can only get it every once in a while. And, well, you know, anything that's called Kirsten Donk, and you uh -huh. drink it, you got you can only imagine how bad it is. Woohoo, boy! <laughs> Two of them. That's the noise you make, body. huh? That's the noise you make knocking. That's the noise you make when you go down. Here's some dunk. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty good. This is actually really yeah. good. It yeah. is uh, 9.5. Wow, that's 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 stout, heavy duty. <laughs> yeah, that's stout. industrial strength. Yeah. So, yeah. One of these days we'll have to do a macro brew night. Oh, yes. That'd be you great. Know. Yeah. A couple beat uh, butt heavies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Um, well, we're going to talk about Casca Montiano. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a pretty well known story. Actually, uh, when I was teaching a while back, um, I used to teach this on the college level mm -hmm. because it is such a well done, well contained story. It is. It's short and brutal. Oh, brutal! Yeah, and it gets to like the uh, the heart of some of Poe's darkest fears. Yes, you know um, yeah. he was terrified of being entombed alive. Right. As a lot of people at the time were, and we'll uh, we'll probably get into that. But you know, Saved by the Bell, you know that's yeah. yeah, you know where it comes from, right? Right. The little bell, they would uh, string a bell onto uh, onto a line and run it into the coffin, and if you came to in your coffin, you could ring that bell, and Absolutely. they would come dig you up. Yeah, that's uh. So, that's, yeah. That happened a lot. History is fascinating. Yes, it is. <laughs> like, and brutal. <laughs> and brutal. And people are, uh, you know, people say it's the violent video games, but video games didn't exist back then. They were still chopping people's heads uh, off. So, you know, you, you, I you think stop and, people have always been rough. You stop and you think for a moment about what you see on a video game, and then um, 
put that on somebody that lived through the American Civil War or the Revolution, oh, or yeah. just life on a front in a frontier town. Mm. You know, because life in a frontier town could be pretty brutal. Oh yeah, as we see in your novella. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank give you a little that. plug. Yes, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, 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 and you kind of see that in Poe's biography. Oh, yeah. And you've got some excellent notes here on Poe's uh, biography. Yeah, let's get into that. Let's do. The Cask of Amontillado was uh, first published in November in 1846. Mm -hmm. It was in an issue of Goody's Ladies Book, which was... Mm -hmm. At the time, one of the most popular periodicals in America. You know, okay. he was not one of those people who uh, had no success until after he was gone. He oh, was, no. well he was very successful. Yeah. Yeah. He was known both for his writing uh, and for his criticism. Yes. He was a very well-known critic. Um, mm -hmm. I think in our first episode, I read some of his criticism um, yeah. of Hawthorne. Which mm -hmm. in which he sort of outlines the blueprint of the American short story. Yes. So very well known, very well respected. Uh, mm -hmm. The Raven was a critical success and a popular success. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, rare. Hmm? it's rare that a poet is recognized in their lifetime. Very rare, especially one who was doing something so avant-garde. Mm hmm. You know, and before Poe, before Poe, Americans, when they, they look to literature, they look to English literature Absolutely. with the advent of Poe. Americans look to America for literature. He brought it home. Mm -hmm. He was the progenitor, you know. Right. Um, so in a lot of ways, horror is an American art form. Yes. You know? Absolutely. It is the jazz of uh, literature, right? Yes, yes. Uh, that's apt, yes. Yeah, so the story was published uh, an additional time during his life in the New England Weekly Review, uh, and that was in 1846. Um, Poe had sort of a rough, short life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He did. Um, he was born in 1809, January 19th. In Boston, and you know he's a Bostonian through and through, hometown mm -hmm. boy. Both his uh, father and mother died before he was three. They were professional actors, and he was raised by the Allen family in Richmond, Virginia. And so, it's important. I think it's important to note here that um, actors in the early eight. 1800s, it was definitely not a respected profession. No, it's only in recent history that it's become respected. Right, right. You know, um, I know that in Shakespeare's time, they were viewed as liars. Yes. Which is uh, kind of like, you know, then why are you going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because the globe wasn't exactly empty. No, it was not. And of course, we have this skewed vision of Shakespeare, you know, we elevate him and we call him the bard, but really Shakespeare was writing for the masses and um, it was not well thought of to go to the refined, respectable people didn't go to the Globe Theater. Yeah. I, uh, they actually uh, recreated some of his plays and, you know, when you uh, go see them, if you, know the language mm -hmm. right and understand mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. full of dick jokes just so oh, yeah. Many dick jokes. yeah yeah he 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 shakespeare is uh somewhere between pornography and uh horror yeah so he's he's kind of like uh the amicus of the 1600s yeah i heard him uh described as the uh john hughes mm -hmm. of very apt of the age. Yeah. You know, like, so anyway, back to Poe, um, 
he went to boarding school and then the University of Virginia. He was a great student, brilliant, mm -hmm. brilliant mind. Um, had to leave school because uh, his dad or his foster father refused to pay his gambling debts. Right. Which uh, that's where we start to see some of the seeds of what his life is going to become like later. Mm hmm. Because he had uh, he had a lot of personal problems. Yes. A lot of them, you mm -hmm. know, opiate user. Mm -hmm. uh, Heavy drinker. Heavy drinker, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and he would drink, uh, what, what is it, absinthe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Back when you used to cut it with wormwood and laudanum. Yes. The Green Fairy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, if you've ever had absinthe, you would need a fairy to come to you. You need help. I have, and ironically <laughs> right <laughs> yes yeah you gotta have you gotta have some sort of mythical being to guide you through that so he returned to richmond virginia but his relationship with his foster father deteriorated in 1827 he moved to boston enlisted in the army his first collection of poems tamberlane and other poems was published that year in, in 1829, he published a second collection. They didn't receive a lot of attention mm -hmm. at the time. Now, following his service, he was admitted to the United States Military Academy, but he was again forced to leave because of lack of financial support. He moved into the home of his aunt and her daughter in Baltimore, Maryland. He began to sell short stories to magazines around this time, and in 1835, he became the editor of the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond, where he moved with his aunt and cousin to Virginia. In 1836, he married his cousin, Virginia, who was 13 years old. Yep. Not uncommon at the time. And no. There's a lot of speculation as to whether or not that was just a marriage of convenience to help her out, mm -hmm. whether it was romantic or not. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say he, uh, he probably, it, it was probably an arrangement, you know? I, I would think that it was, yeah. Because he didn't write poems about her. No. You know? Yeah. You know, over the next 10 years, he would edit a number of literary journals, including Gentleman's Magazine, Graham's Magazine, and the Broadway Journal. Um, he established himself as a poet and a short story writer and an editor, and he published some of his best-known work, including The Fall of the House of Usher, The Telltale Heart, which we'll get to at some point. Oh, yeah. The Murders in the Rue Morgue, and, of course, The Raven. Yes. After his wife died from tuberculosis, he uh, sort of descended into depression and his alcoholism worsened. He returned to Richmond in 1849 and set out for an editing job. He stopped in Baltimore. On April 3rd, 1849, he was found in a state of semi-consciousness. Uh, he died four days later. No. Uh, they... Diagnosed him with acute congestion of the brain, which uh, was sort of a catch-all diagnosis. Yeah. 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 And basically, it meant swelling, hemorrhaging. Doctor uh, saying, hey, he screwed up. We don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, a lot of speculation as to whether or not he was rabid. Yeah. Um, he also could have been... Um, there were a lot of people going around, and they would uh, catch people, get them drunk, mm -hmm. beat them up, rob mm -hmm. them. He mm -hmm. might have that might have happened because uh, there are some reports that he wasn't wearing his own clothes; he was wearing someone right. else's. Right. It's a very, very strange death. Yeah. 
in American history. And there's been a lot of discussion about what actually might have happened. I've even heard some speculation that it was entirely possible that his worst fears were realized and he was buried alive because he was in a drug induced coma. So, which could very well have been true and would have been yeah. fitting. It would, yeah, yeah. So, there's a lot, lot of speculation about that. One thing that I wanted to ask you, and it's something that a teacher said in high school that's always stuck with me. Um, he blamed himself for Virginia's death because uh -huh. they were poor. And of course, tuberculosis isn't caused by exposure, but it's made worse. Mm -hmm. And it, it's exposure worsened her condition and she died. And then he blamed himself for that. Yeah. Is that true? I, I believe it is because right. afterwards he definitely worsens. Mm -hmm. you know, substance abuse gets worse. His depression gets worse. Right. His output, his, uh, cause he was, he was a very prolific writer. Yes. But not so much towards the end. Right. Um, I think he probably did blame himself. It's, it's hard to speculate on an, on a person's intentions and their, right. their thoughts, but they could have moved. There were a lot of things that could have happened. He kept taking writing jobs. And a lot mm -hmm. of times they, uh, they suggested warm air for tuberculosis, mm -hmm. warm, dry mm -hmm. air. And he didn't, you know? Yeah. 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 I don't know if you've ever been to Baltimore. It's muggy. Yeah. It's not, not, not a place to, to have consumption. You know? No, no. I don't think there are too many good places to have consumption. No. 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 Of course, uh, you know they they sent a lot of people to Arizona and the Southwest. Yeah, but that this was before that was really a possibility. Yeah, so you know, God, that would be the worst travel bureau ad ever. <laughs> yes, it would be. <laughs> Come to New Mexico. Doc it's a great place to have consumption. Join Doc and Tombstone. <laughs> Get an extra three years. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, but this is one of his well-known stories. It's uh, like I said, it's, it's well taught. It's well, ver you know, it's well discussed. It's my favorite post story. Really? Yeah. I love the cask of Amontillado and I think I love it so much because I love um, the short in Tales of Terror where it's Vincent Price and Peter Lorre. Vincent Price plays Fortunata and Peter Lorre plays Montresso. And um, that's one of my favorite shorts. Yeah. And this is one of my favorite stories. When, when did that come out? Uh, I've got it in my notes. I believe it was 60. Oh, shoot. Hang on just a second. 1962. 1962. 1962. Cause I remember that one. Also mm -hmm. later. Um, Vincent Price did a dramatic reading of the story. He did. Yeah. And that's, if, that's, if you want to look it up is available on YouTube. Yeah. It's really pretty good. And you, if you haven't heard it, you should hear it. I tell you what, Vincent Price could read just about anything and make it sound good. Yeah. I always wanted to get a parrot and leave in a room with Vincent Price movies and see if it'll talk. All spooky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But you know, I have other aspirations, but that's just one of them. Yeah. So I guess you want to get into the story a little bit? Let's get into the story a little bit. Um one of the things that strikes strikes me right out of the gate is Montresor is talking about this guy, who, you know, Fortunata, he has suffered insults at the hands of Fortunata. There's no yeah. explanation. No. He doesn't tell us what the insults were. Mm -hmm. We just are to understand that they are, that Montresor has taken them very badly, but that Fortunata still believes that they're friends. The exact wording is really interesting here. Okay. Now, yeah. I'm glad we started here because, you know, yeah. you might as well start with the first sentence. Yes. A thousand injuries of Fortunato. 
I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. Yeah. Like, okay, so ventured upon insult doesn't even necessarily mean that it was intentional. Right. In that fact, it probably wasn't. Right. Because you get the feeling that Fortunata is just, has no reason not to trust him. Yeah. You know, he goes on to say, and I mean, like we talked about before, Poe says, if you're not with the first sentence mm -hmm. pushing towards the end, then you failed. Yeah. Right? Right. So he says, you who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that gave utterance to a threat. That I gave utterance to a threat. That is so he cool. doesn't threaten him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say anything about it. He just yeah. logs it away. The old Mongol proverb, revenge is a dish best served cold. Was that Mongol? It is actually Mongol, yes. Oh, okay. I thought it was Klingon. It gets adapted by the Klingons, but yeah. Okay. It, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now I feel dumb. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I didn't know that was a real proverb. That is actually a real proverb. Yeah. So, um, let's run through what happens because it's a yes. short story. It's a very short story. So basically, Montresor is talking to an unspecified audience. Mm -hmm. You, the reader, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And he's talking about the day he takes his revenge on Fortunato. Mm -hmm. So he runs into him mm -hmm. at Carnival. Yes. Fortunato is wearing a Jester's Motley, which is sort of like a Harlequin piebald costume. He's wearing uh, the bells. The belt cap, mm -hmm. you know, he's dressed like a fool, like a clown. Yes. Which uh, we'll get back to. It's not exactly yes. the most subtle imagery. So, not at all, but yeah. Yeah. So he lures him into uh, the catacombs under his mansion by telling him that he's obtained a pipe, which is uh, about 130 gallons of what he believes to be a Montiana, which as far as I can tell, is a rare sherry. Mm -hmm. I think we were talking before we uh, started recording today. I was in the liquor store today looking for it, and uh, it's not around. <laughs> you know, so. I've never seen it, and I have uh, crawled through many liquor stores in my life. I thought you were going to say Crips. <laughs> I was like, wow, dude. A few of those, too. <laughs> So he lures him into this crypt by saying, you know, I'm going to ask Lucrece uh, for a private tasting. But Fortunato's like, no, that guy's a fool. I'm a better wine taster. You right? do get, you do get that Fortunato is awfully full of himself. Very. Because he says, you know, Lucrece wouldn't know, wouldn't know Amontillado from Sherry. Which is funny because Amontillado is a type of sherry. Yes, yes. So, so he um, he is definitely put. He definitely has a high opinion of himself. Oh yeah, and he's vain. Mm -hmm. Very vain. Very vain. So Fortunato has a bad cough. Montresor keeps saying, "No, we'll turn around." You know, it's too wet. It's too dark. The dampness will be bad for you. You know, if we're talking about uh, Poe and the idea of tuberculosis and consumption. Yes. You know, this is of an especially dark stroke in the work. Right. Uh, Fortunato basically says, I will not die of a cough. Montresor agrees, which is pretty funny. Foreshadowing, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then... Um, Long story short, they walk down to the bottom of the crypt mm -hmm. into uh, into a uh, 
a vault that has been decorated with bones. It's an ossuary. Yes. Uh, which is one of my favorite words. And it just, it has such a rich sound to it. And uh, it's so creepy. An ossuary. <laughs> it is creepy. Of bones. Mm-hmm. And he tells him, okay, you see that niche over there? That is where the Amontillado is. When he wa- when Fortunato walks in there, who Fortunato's pretty drunk at this point. Mm-hmm. When Fortunato walks in there, Montresor follows him in, chains him to the wall, and entombs him alive. Yes. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. He reveals that 50 years later, he's still in there. No one has disturbed the bones. The the thing that gets me is that there is no remorse at all, except for he does say that when Fortunata is uh, pretending that it's a joke, he shines the light in. And he feels a little bit bad when Fortunato doesn't answer, but then he said, Oh, that's just the dampness of the cellar. Yeah. No I answer. Yeah. I thrust the torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. Yeah. There came in return a, only a jingling of bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. Yeah. And then he ends with, in Latin, may he rest in peace. Yes. So here is speaking of Latin, a section of this that really uh, interested me during their talk or during their walk, Montresor mentions his family coat of arms, a golden foot and a blue background crushing a snake whose fangs are embedded in the foot's heel with the motto, Nemo me impuni lacessit. No one provokes me with impunity, mm-hmm. which is a pretty, that's a pretty grim Latin motto to have on your coat of arms. But then the coat of arms itself is a reference to a line in Genesis where the serpent, you know, God tells the tells Eve that your, your progeny shall tread on the serpent and the serpent shall bruise their heels. Yeah. So my question for you is, uh-huh. Which is Montresor? <laughs> That's one I've been trying to figure out. Is Montresor the sharp serpent or is he the, the person treading on the serpent? Um, because conventional wisdom would have it that he's uh-huh. the he's the foot because it's his right. rest. But this is the original sin. I mean, this yeah. is this is evil. Yeah. I think he's probably the serpent. I think, I think he's he probably uh, been crushed. Mm-hmm. What do you think the insult was? This this is why I, I wanted to bring that. I get the feeling that, um, you know, Montresor's family is old money. They're nobility. Mm-hmm. And he has a coat of arms. And Fortunata is new money mm-hmm. and he uh well only someone that's new money would have would name a child fortunata that's not something that a noble would do that, that's ostentatious then you've got the fact that he makes the he makes the masonic sign mm-hmm. and montresor doesn't know how to answer it and he yeah. says oh you're not a mason and he produces a trowel from out of his coat as a symbol that he is a Mason. He's really not. So Mason of sorts. <laughs> he's a Mason of sorts, not that kind of Mason. So Fortunata is this uh, Nova Reach person who is kind of lording it over everybody, probably not intending to insult anybody, yeah. but his very existence is an insult to someone that comes from the old nobility. That, that that would be my take on it. Yeah, because I I can't imagine. Well, I mean, this gets into something I wanted to talk about a little bit. Okay. This is an unreliable narrator. Absolutely. 
um, a lot of Poe's narrators are unreliable, right? Mm -hmm. He has every reason to lie to you. Mm -hmm. You know, to make himself look better, Mm -hmm. to make himself look harder. Mm -hmm. But he's already telling a story that would incriminate him, right? Yes. Yes. So one wonders, is this person insane? Yes. He's a sociopath. There, 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 uh, there's no, there. I mean, the fact that he has one little bit of remorse, but he rejects that remorse mm-hmm. and says it's just the dampness. Says, man, this dude is this. He's gone. Mm-hmm. You know, he so, can't even begin to connect it. No, no, so. absolutely not. And in his mind. Line, Hmm? What was the name of the guy in American Psycho? Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember. Bateman, right? Yes, Bateman. That's it. Yeah. There's there's an element of that in here. Mm-hmm. Yes. That obsession with mm-hmm. the surface level. Yes. Montresor seems like the kind of person who... You would look into their eyes and there's nothing there. Yeah. Exactly. Shark's eyes. Exactly. Um, another famous Poe work with an unreliable narrator is, of course, The Telltale Heart. Of course, yes. Um, the Telltale Heart, beginning with ner- true, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I have been and am. Mm-hmm. But why will you say that I'm mad? I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again as a warning to anyone out there. If someone says, why wouldn't you say I'm crazy? That means they're crazy. That's right. You know, if mm-hmm. someone says, I'm not crazy. They, they're you can crazy. put some money on it. They need a trip to go away to the farm. Yeah, I, I I feel like that we're dealing with, okay, you look at the way this story is told, mm-hmm. and Montresor is reflecting on this a half century afterwards, Yeah, which means he's got to be at least in his 80s. I would say 70s maybe, but yeah, 70s. an old man. An old man. Yeah. And normally you would expect an old man to look back on something like this. An old man who's nearing nearing death, who's staring at his own mortality, to try and explain it to the reader and say, you know, I made a mistake. I did. The, but there's none of that. Montessor opens up by telling us why he was justified in doing this. Yeah. There's none of that, um, and we'll get back to this again and again as we talk about horror in America, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Judeo-Christian values inherent in American society, right? Right. Repentance, turning the other cheek, mm-hmm. right? None of that. Nope. You know, he's very proud to have not turned the other cheek. Yes. Um. And then uh, Judeo-Christian values, I mean, it's a big underpinning in American literature. Oh, it's huge. I mean, think of uh, Hawthorne's greatest work, one of the great American novels, The mm-hmm. Scarlet Letter. Hawthorne was yeah. absolutely driven by Puritan influences. Mm-hmm. And many of the, you know, probably the first generation of American writers came from New England and they were all influenced by Puritan thought. Yeah. Because it is such a foundation of that area, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in down here in the South we have, and by the way, spoilers, Duke and I are from the South, if you could. We are. Um, (laughs) Not that the accents gave anything away. Um, but 
down here you had Huguenots, you had Calvinists, you mm -hmm. had uh, the odd Catholic. It was it was a more of a mixed bag. It was a mixed bag, and it was much more open and liberal. And that's difficult because now the tables are reversed, Absolutely. and the sense to be more fundamentalist. But up until the American Civil War, the the South, in terms of its religiosity, was much more open and much more liberal. And that has a lot to do with what was called the uh, the Great Revival, mm -hmm. uh, which was a religious movement right after the Civil War. Right. Um, but well, we'll we get have, We have sinned, so we lost. Yeah. yeah. So... You know, and that plays into that idea of the lost cause, right? Uh, which is a, uh, which is one of the shames. But you know, we're we're straying far afield. <laughs> <laughs> We've left the cask of Amontillado behind. <laughs> yeah, we're, now we're talking about uh, uh, Faulkner. Are we talking about Faulkner now? Yeah, yeah. Let's get back to Poe. <laughs> okay, a little lighter. <laughs> yeah <laughs> a little lighter than Absalom Absalom yes um, so there's a lot of dramatic irony in the story I think mm -hmm. that's usually what it's taught as mm -hmm. um, it's funny it is funny it's in a sick funny. way it, it's, it's very black but it's funny oh yeah oh you're not gonna die of a cough Fortunata oh yeah the yeah. uh I mean the first time I really understood mm -hmm. the joke that is him producing the trowel to say I'm a Mason. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. That's a good yeah, joke. That is a good yeah. joke. That is a solid joke right there. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, I think that's often overlooked in Poe's work mm -hmm. is how funny he is. Mm -hmm. Um. Imp of the Perverse by him. Yeah. Uh, which is a, about a spirit that comes to you when you're too drunk. It's hilarious. <laughs> yes, it is. I had forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah, it's made out of empty uh, wine bottles, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, full disclosure, I was a spooky kid and, uh, I had Poe's complete works, right? Yes. Yes, I did pour it over it again and again. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved it. Yes. And part of it was this mixture of just dark humor mm -hmm. and the macabre. Yes. Um, Poe po is totally at home with the macabre. Oh, yeah. And when you have, I mean, okay, there is a tale that Hawthorne writes, and I don't even remember the name of it, but it's the, it's like the farmer's wife. It's a witch out in the woods or something. I don't remember. But he's telling it. It's almost, you can tell that he's ashamed of himself for telling it. Yeah. Poe embraces it, baby. Oh, yeah. That's, you know, that's his gig, and he's he's happy with it. Oh, yeah, he's all there. He's mm -hmm. all in. You know, um, he's actually sort of the the father of the American Gothic tale. Yes. Yeah. Um, Gothic, you know, and this is my own theory on the Gothic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So indulge mm -hmm. me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Gothic has three main elements. Yes. Isolation. Mm -hmm. inversion mm -hmm. and perversion yes right yes so if you look at something like castle of otranto which comes out in the early uh what year was that i want to say it's the early 1800s but contemporary with poe mm -hmm. and then you look at frankenstein and you look at something like Dracula, you see this over and over. Right. But it's really at home in Poe's work. Yes. Right? So inversion. Mm -hmm. 
you see inversion here with the mason joke, mm -hmm. the idea of the foot and the serpent, mm -hmm. the inversion of Christian values, mm -hmm. puritanical values, right? Yes. It's yes. all taking something and flipping it. Yes. Right? Yes, I agree. And I, I will I will tell you, you know, we're very comfortable with Dracula. We're very comfortable with Frankenstein. Poe Poe was writing pulp fiction a hundred years before the pulp magazines existed. The Absolutely. world is not comfortable in the same room with Poe. Uh even now it's yeah. upsetting. It's upsetting. Yes. You know, um, I, can, you know I can read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and go sleep like a baby. Oh, yeah. I read this, chills are running up and down my spine. There's something so aggressive about it. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between a rock song and a death metal song. Yes. One That's of them is rebellious. The other one's in your face dark. Yes. Yes. You know? At the end of the day, Mary Shelley is writing in defense of the social order. She is writing to say Dr. Frankenstein is evil for trying to subvert God's order and create this being. Poe is Poe doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't weigh in one one way or the other. No, no, he doesn't. He's just writing this story about this sociopathic murderer and his tale of revenge. Yeah. So we see that inversion. Yeah. You know, the isolation is obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in a crypt. They're surrounded by bones. It is uh, leaking nitro, nitro, salt yeah. paper in the cracks. Yeah. Yeah, because it the the crypt actually runs beneath a river. Yeah, so you're as far down and deep and buried, right? Mm -hmm. It's dank, it's dripping. It probably smells like sulfur. Yeah, I mean, it's just a nasty place. It's hell. Yes, it's literally hell. Yeah, um, in a very Sumerian way, it's hell. Yes. And then, of course, the perversity, the uh, supernatural, the insanity, the grotesquerie, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, Absolutely. that's all present. Yes. Here is something else that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Fortunata pleads and begs to come out. Yeah. And that doesn't work. And then Fortunata starts laughing. And he says... Oh, this is a hilarious joke. But isn't it time to let me out and we'll go meet Mrs. Fortunata and the others, the other revelers? And then when that track fails, he falls silent. And I, we already discussed the fact that uh, Montresor sticks a, touch, a torch in, all he hears is the bells. Yeah. There's no answer. Yeah. So... Did he die? Did he just give up and realize that there's no use anymore? I mean. I think he just gave up. Yeah, I think he did too. That was my feeling, you know, that yeah. he just gave up. Which is another super dark moment. Yeah. You Not know, only did he kill him, he broke him. He broke him. You know, and that mentioning his wife and his friends in mm -hmm. the end. And Montresor is like, yeah, they're going to miss you. Yeah. No, uh, no, uh, no arguments there. Yeah, they sure so are going to miss you. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit Lovecraftian in that both of them are, you know, Montresor is definitely a sociopath. And then I mean, the last we see of Fortunata, he has lost his mind. Yeah. And Lovecraftian is, uh, it's a word we're going to bandy around a lot, but Lovecraft, Lovecraft is sort of maybe maybe it would be more appropriate to say that Lovecraft was Poean. 
I think so, because I think he was definitely influenced by Poe and Derelith oh, yeah. and the people who came before him. You it, know? If you've ever been if you've ever been through a high school English class, you're you're influenced by Poe. Either that or you didn't get your you didn't do your homework. Yeah. I mean I didn't do either, but <laughs> still influenced by Poe. <laughs> you know, my earliest memories of Poe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I co-host a horror show and I grew up watching one ever, ever city that had TV stations had a horror host and they did shock theater or whatever they called it regionally. Our horror host in Chattanooga was Dr. Shock and Dingbat. But every once in a while, they would read a Poe poem you know, a short Poe poem that was creepy or scary or funky or they'd have students read one, different things. So I remember that. And of course, a lot of times what they'd be playing were the Roger Corman, Vincent Price, loosely Poe-based movies. Yeah. And so that was my first exposure to Edgar Allan Poe. You know what one of my first exposures to Poe was? What's that? The Simpsons. The what? The Simpsons. Oh, yes. Green yes. House of Horror, where they did The Raven. Yeah, they did The Raven. I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah, it's a good one. Mm-hmm. It's a good one. You know, and uh, I think Poe lends himself uniquely to the horror host genre. Yes. Because he is so in your face. Yes. You know, a horror host is... Uh, I don't know, like goth drag in a way, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it campy, it's kitschy, mm-hmm. but it's earnest. Yes. And Poe was a lot of things, but he was earnest. Yes, he was. You know, um, he was trying to produce the most bang for your buck you know Mm -hmm. he says and uh his review of twice told tales by hawthorne that you know a skillful literary artist and i'm paraphrasing a skillful literary artist has fashioned his events to serve his singular effect right now it just so happens that pose um singular effect was horror yes you know what what would you say to the statement that horror and pornography are the two sides of the same coin i would say that that's very accurate you know um, yeah two sides of strong emotions um a visceral effect visceral uh violence often plays in both yeah yeah yeah. And it produces a literal physical reaction. Yes. Uh, a release Literally. of endorphins. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and uh, something that I, that I love about Poe, I don't know of anybody that is a more eloquent writer. I've never read a more eloquent writer. Now I will tell you that token Token understands all shades of the meaning of a word going back 1,200 years. So <laughs> Token, he, was a linguist. he was a linguist. So Token, Token will use the English language in ways that nobody else ever uses it. Mm-hmm. But Poe is a more elegant writer. And a more elegant, more beautiful writer you could never imagine. But you don't guess at the symbolism with Poe. No. There's yes, no he, guessing. It's not contrived. You know he hits you with it, bam, and you know what he's trying to say. Oh, yeah. Um, who do you think was more, I mean, you know, the full Fortunato, mm-hmm. Montresor, mm-hmm. Uh, which, you know, they're just layers upon layers of symbols, right? Yes. But they're Absolutely. all very obvious. Right. Do you think that's a matter of not trusting your audience? I think given the world that Poe was writing in, 
Mm-hmm. It's a matter of understanding your audience. Okay. He was dealing that. with people who, you know, the United States in the 1830s was not, you know, higher education was relatively rare. Yeah. And so most of his people had enough education to read. Yeah. And they would have known the one book they would have known would have been the Bible. So that's where you get a lot of biblical references. That's why you get a lot of biblical references. That is kind of lingua franca, lingua franca at that time. And to this, at this time too, you can still do that. Yeah. But, but he was dealing with people that probably could read the paper, but that was about it. And he knew that. So he was uh, speaking to the masses, as it were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, I don't know. I, I love this story. I love Poe in general, though. I do, too. Um, even the really bad, like, 60s and 70s reimaginings, as it were. Oh, yeah. They're some of the best movies ever made. Uh, Tales of Terror is one of my favorite uh, favorite of that genre yeah. and has the cask of Amontillado, which they kind of, they kind of mess around with it. And in it's that hard. telling of the story, uh, Montresor is jealous because Fortunata is making time with his wife. There you go. And Montresor is uh, one of the best wine test tasters in Italy, but he gets drunk falling down drunk. And so uh, Fortunata takes him home one night when he's too drunk to get home and he keeps his wife company Um, that evening and Montresor finds out. And I think they did that because they probably felt like it was too vague a thing. If they left it the way Poe wrote it, it was too vague for people to grasp onto so they made it very, uh, but, but that same show had the the strange case of M. Valdemar. And I can't think of the other one, but there's another good one in there too. Now that's my favorite post story. Yes, that's a good one. That is a good one. It's creepy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very creepy. It's, uh, you know, I, I saw, um, and I don't remember what I where I saw this, but this was someone that has spent their whole life studying Poe, a Poe historian, if you will. Yeah. And this person was I talking about, yeah, yeah, talking about the fact that Poe essentially invented American horror. Uh huh. Poe invented the detective story. Yes. Poe invented With, uh... science fiction. <laughs> you know, I mean. I'll... I'll disagree with you there because I think Wells did. I think I think Wells did too, but what this person was arguing that were that the roots were there in Poe. Yeah, and I don't know that I agree with that. Everything she said, but you know, I have to agree with the horror and the detective story. Absolutely, there's actually no disagreement there. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, the purloined letter, murders in the Rue Morgue, mm-hmm. those are. Those are detective stories. Yeah. And the first ones. Yeah. It wasn't. It's so weird to think that that wasn't a thing yet. Right. Like this guy was out there blazing a trail. Mm -hmm. And then you have people like Lovecraft, like Howard, like Stephen King, who we'll be talking about in a couple weeks. Yes, we will. Um, come back and they can't get away from those roots. No. Those three things I talked about, Mm -hmm. isolation, inversion, and perversion, those are always going to be present in American horror. Even in American Gothic, like you look at uh, someone like Flannery O'Connor. Yes. You still see it there. Yeah. You see it in Faulkner. You see it in Hemingway. Yes. Yes. Well, and I will go, okay, you know, the class, probably the two classic Gothic horror tales are Dracula and uh, Frankenstein. Yeah. Definitely 
you have you have uh, those three elements in Dracula. Mm-hmm. Then you have uh, you have them in Frankenstein as well. Yeah, you know, and, and they're exploited. But you want to get really serious about your vampires, uh, Carmilla. Oh yes, Carmilla. Yes, that. Okay, so Dracula is an important work. Carmilla is a great work. Yes, absolutely. And there's a distinction. There is a definite distinction, and you you read you know here again i can read dracula and lay down at night and feel perfectly safe you read carmilla mm. <laughs> that's some scary stuff oh yeah it uh it gets under your skin in a weird way yes you know good horror yeah. does if it yeah. doesn't get under your skin it's not good horror yeah, uh, what was the old saying? I think it was a William Castle movie they used it. It was, uh, if it doesn't make your skin crawl, it's on too tight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Or the classic, just keep telling yourself it's only a movie. Yes. You know, so, well, I think that's about our time for this week. Uh, what do you got to pitch? What have I got to pitch? Well, Tennessee Macabre is uh, going to be on. We're moving to three different broadcast networks now. Excellent. We're going to be on ECN Channel 01, which is an internet channel. It's based in Florida, but if you got a computer, you can pull it up. We we'll come on at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. And this week we will be showing House on Haunted Hill starring Vincent Price. Uh, of course, by the time this is out, that will already have been done. I forgot we're we're recording ahead, but yeah. you can tune in Saturday nights at ten uh, on ACN channel 01. You can uh, t- catch us on Roku and Kindle on ITV Chattanooga at uh, ten o'clock Central Time. That's uh, eleven Eastern, and then at midnight. You can catch us on Other Worlds TV on Roku, and all those times are on Saturday night. So there's three different places you can catch us Saturday night. Now, if you haven't watched Other Worlds TV, it is a blast. Yes, it is. They do a thing on their website. Are they still doing that where you can vote off a movie? Yes, you can vote. You can vote a movie off, and um, once a week they have a they vote somebody to the island. And uh, of course, you can go in and, with Other Worlds TV that you can you can watch, download the Other Worlds app and watch Other Worlds TV totally free. Yeah. But you can pay five dollars to Patreon and get the Other Worlds vault, and you can pull up anything that they have, and they have a considerable collection. But they actually have a heading for all the movies that have been voted off, so you can go watch them. And it, some of them are a trip, man. Uh, <laughs> You know, it reminds me of just like the early days of, and I was I was watching something about video stores, right? Yeah, yes. And I miss video stores. I do too. There used to be a place in Athens when I lived there. I was a young punk living in mm-hmm. Athens, mm-hmm. And, uh, playing in a punk band, and uh, not going to school. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we used to go to a place called Vision Video. Shout out to a dead. Yeah you know, defunct video store. Yeah. Um, we just go to this place called Vision Video and they had a five for five deal. And basically yeah. they had a whole rack that they just, that just said cult. Yes. And it was all the trauma movies, all the weird stuff, you know? Yes. Yes. You know, I love those video stores. Some stuff I wish I hadn't seen. <laughs> uh, and that was a whole industry just like the drive-in movie industry had been 15 years before. There was a whole horror industry that was dedicated to just producing these movies for video and getting them out to people. Oh, yeah. Straight to VHS. You Straight to VHS. Yeah. I uh, I grew up on straight to VHS. I did, too. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, they had a five for five deal, so I'd rent one movie I, I thought would be good, and then four that I was like, well, Rockabilly Vampire seems all right. 
Why not? <laughs> Which, if you haven't seen that one, it's a trip. Um, not making it up. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I don't know. TV reminds me of that. It's like being stuck in a video store, uh huh, with the hipster kid. Yes, it's like no, you got to see this. <laughs> yes. And they're right most of the time. Yes. If yeah. they're wrong, you can vote it off. So, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and they've got they've got all kinds of titles. I mean, if you haven't tuned into the world's TV, you need to. You're going to love it. Yeah. So. And they have a lot of horror hosts, other than Neil and I. I mean, there, there's Friday, Friday through Sunday is all horror hosts. So. Which is awesome. So what do you got? Um, well, my band Blood Oaks is uh-huh. uh, recording our our uh, our full length album. North oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Um, which the album name will probably change three times before this airs, but uh, <laughs> I'm going back and forth. But I'm voting yeah. North Georgia Death Cult, and. Yeah. Uh, I'm singing and playing banjo in that, and uh, I've got Pulp Factory, which we just opened up, and we're starting to do a whole new set. Uh, basically, what Pulp Factory is, is it's a love letter to Weird Tales. Yes, indeed. Um, we publish a piece of prompt art every month, and we encourage people to write based on that prompt art. We also take just horror, sci-fi, fantasy, genre fiction of any kind, crime thriller. You know, we're uh, now accepting artwork and poetry, and uh, we'll be publishing some editorials. And uh, I'm going to be publishing something coming up soon about the creature from the Black Lagoon and post colonialism oh, Yeah. You know, because uh, that's a really important uh, film. You know, It's uh, huge. It's huge. One of my favorite films of all time. Yeah. And um, we actually we actually licensed the creature about two years ago and showed it at a backyard drive-in, and that was a lot of fun. Can't can't do it on TV because I can't license it. But it drove horror for twenty years. I mean, mm-hmm. people were trying to replicate it. Well, you know, and it was uh, one of the first monsters uh created by a woman you mm-hmm. know the monster design and yeah it's just it's a groundbreaking film so yes. gonna, you know i'll be writing an analysis about that and uh so anyway and the idea of the sympathetic monster the sim- yes because it is a bit the creature is very sympathetic yeah he's the perfectly guilt. happy to stay in the amazon and not bother anybody you yeah know. this you know just wants to hang out and eat fish. Right. Yeah. So, well, that's it for Reaper's Digest. We'll see you in two weeks where we'll be discussing Salem's Lot. Yes, indeed. Stephen King. Stephen King. So please join us. You don't want to miss that. Oh, absolutely not. It's going to be a heavy hitter, two-part episode. I'm mm-hmm. going to try and get Duke drunk. It'll be great. <laughs> well, you don't have to try too hard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Good night.